You guys are always asking me about great books to help you on your healing and transformation journey. And I gotta tell you this week, I'm really excited because sometimes you forget about those books. And one of the books that had one of the greatest impacts on my journey was The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. Uh, we've got Robin Sharma with us on The Higher Self this week. How are you? Great to meet you, Danny. Good to meet I'm, you I'm as good, well. thanks. Yeah, I, I wanna get right into it. Sure. Um, that that book, right? That uh, that book was me. That book was me. That book was uh, it, it was such a mirror for me because it uh, was reflecting back to me at a time in my life where I was beginning my my awakening per, per se, and um, it showed me parts of me that I didn't know existed. Parts of me that I I needed. You know, I needed the, it wasn't a Ferrari, it was an Aston Martin. Uh, I needed the suit, I needed the tie, I needed this this power and I was on a hamster wheel going, 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 going. And, and quite frankly, I didn't even know where I was going or why I was even going there or where the destination was. And that book, just seeing an example that it was possible to quote unquote, sell the Ferrari and like change your life was like, wow, for me. So how did that book begin? How did that concept begin for you? Well, first of all, um, I want to congratulate you on all the lives you're touching and on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. And it's great to finally meet you. Yeah, it's good to meet you too. So uh, I used to be a litigation lawyer. I was successful in the world, very empty on the inside. And what's the point of success while losing your soul? And I think a lot of people on the planet right now are chasing a version of success that society has sold them only to find out that when they get it or get some of it, there's nothing there. And so that's what happened to me. I was successful in the world. I had a lovely car, a great place to live. I was a litigation lawyer. Everyone thought I was successful. And I, I was like a hollow person. And so I went on my odyssey, just like you mentioned a bit yours, and I, I was experimented with meditation and I worked with spiritual counselors and I read a lot of the philosophy books and great books of wisdom. And I found very wise people. And I went on this journey where I made a big transformation in my own life. And I thought I'd write about it and share it with other people. So I self-published The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. I don't know if you know that in a 24 mm -hmm. hour, yeah, in a 24 hour copy shop. My father helped me sell the book at service clubs, one book at a time. And one day, uh, we're here in the studio with my son, Colby. And so Colby was about four years old at the time. And we happened to be in a bookstore. And um, I, there were five books on consignment. The bookstore didn't even buy the books. They were just on consignment. So I was signing the books up at the front counter. And there's a gentleman, I still remember, he was in a green trench coat and he was watching the whole scene unfold. And then eventually, Danny, he came over and he said, oh, the monk who sold his Ferrari, what an interesting title. Tell me about yourself. I said, oh, this is what I do. I said, oh, this book has been a labor of love. I want to get it out to many people. And he said, oh, very interesting. And then he pulled out a wallet and he handed me his business card. And on it, it said, Ed Carson, president of HarperCollins. Ah. And that started this ride where I've written more books and uh, moved ahead with my life. I love that. Did you ever think you'd be an author when you were a lawyer? No. 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 I've always, I've always loved being creative, but I never had this vision. I think if you're open to life, life will lead you in the most interesting of places. And I think that's where a lot of us get trapped. And I say this with a lot of respect, but... I believe the the heart is so much wiser than the head. That's right. And the head the head is basically the knowledge and the beliefs that society has seduced us into thinking are truths. And the head and the intellect is, you know, it's very calculating and it tells us what's logical, but I think and I hope I get this quote right. I think of George Bernard Shaw and he said, "The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists." and adapting the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be unreasonable and our heart knows what's best. 
and and if you don't like it, I know you're fine with it, but if you, your listeners and viewers don't like the word hard, if it sounds soft, I think it's very hard but and strong. But you're, I'm just speaking of your instinct. We all, we all have instincts that get clouded in the noisiness of our world. And if only we could hear that quiet, still voice within saying, start this project, launch this business, find this love, we would do... We, there would be more grace, ease, and true success in our lives. It's so interesting while you're speaking, um, I'm feeling like an energy like here and here. And it's because this morning I was laying, um, uh, we, I, not this morning, it was like 3, 4 a.m., the baby, we just fed the baby. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm always like getting messages that I want to share with people. And one of the messages that came in was, you know, one of the beautiful things about, um, I call it awakening, right? Uh, you can call it, you know, whatever you want to call it, but is that it feels as though you go from this existence where you're constantly questioning something outside of you about what your life is about and why things happen and why things happen to you. And you go from that to just this resonance and this feeling and this knowing that you are the one and you are the one that is creating it all. And as a result, you have the capacity to create whatever it is that you want to create, right? And as you're speaking, like that, that's what you're that's what you're saying essentially is like go from this doubt and this worry and this confusion that the world is trying to keep you in and find this find this truth in here. My question for you is how did you find it? Like, what was that process like for you? I think you're giving me too much credit, Danny. I mean, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still on the path. <laughs> yeah. I think the top of one mountain is the bottom of the next. And the most honest thing I could say to you is I'm not at all where I want to be as a human being. I'm not at all at the mountaintop of my spiritual path, my creative path, my energetic path, my path of service. Really, I'm a, I'm a missionary. I'm I'm on a I'm on a crusade to remind people about their heroism versus their egoism. I'm on a crusade to remind people through my books and podcasts and et cetera, et cetera. You know, trying to help them get to where they want to be. Mm -hmm. I'm not where I want to be, but I'm so much farther than where I used to be. Yet I, I still am trying to figure things out. There's That's things right. I don't know. And I think maybe the history has had a few enlightened souls, but not very many. Yeah. So I think what I've experienced on the spiritual path, on the growth path, on the personal development path, is as soon as you heal or move through one block, you get another block to heal. And I would say, and I think this is hopefully a powerful idea, but it's this path of personal growth and remembering your primal genius. And I want to, maybe we'll come back to this word remembering, but this path of growth and remembering your primal genius and who you truly are can be very difficult at times. And I sense, you know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. And yet it's the best way to spend the rest of your life. That's right. I think building a business is great. I think writing books is great. I think living in the world, absolutely great. But what is more important than spending the rest of your days realizing your personal promise? And I think people who are looking for happiness, they won't find it in a Ferrari. And there's nothing wrong with a Ferrari, nothing wrong with a beautiful hotel room, flying the way you want. We are, we are physical creatures and being around beautiful things, like what's the difference between a beautiful hotel room and a beautiful sunset? They're, they're things. That's right, yeah. So I think in spiritual circles, people make material things wrong. I don't mm -hmm. think there's anything wrong with material things. I would say just don't make them your gods. Yeah. Don't be defined by your Ferrari. Yeah. You know, and the monk who sold his Ferrari, there's nothing wrong with Julian driving that Ferrari, but he was defined like, okay, if I don't have it, I'm nothing. And there are too many good souls on the planet. It's if I don't have this net worth and these five houses and the yachts, or if I don't have the social prestige or the, the right number of social followers, well, then I'm, I'm nothing. That's right. So enjoy those things, but I would say don't be 
defined by those things. I, I want to share a story that you're bringing up for me. Um, there were many blocks, um, as you say, and, and I remember one that came up for me was um, I was still living in California. And, um, and at the time, I was already in my process, and um, um, I had this, this big rose gold Rolex, mm. right, with a nice chocolate leather strap. It was beautiful. And um, anyhow, I had decided, it, it started, uh, I, I remember going through this transition of like loving wearing it and then feeling very uncomfortable wearing it. A and I never thought that that would happen to me. It, it almost became like too much. Like wh why, like why do I need that, right? So I had put it away in the safe. And um, a friend invited me to, to, to dinner and he invited me to dinner at the Bel Air Hotel um, uh, at uh, Spago, Spaggy's there, which is wonderful. And um, and I subconsciously, without even thinking about it, said, I'm gonna go get my watch. So I pull up to the safe, I'm putting in the combination, I'm, I'm unlocking and I'm pulling it open. And at the time I was really working with ayahuasca a lot. Um, you can call it source, you can call it whatever. I got a very clear message. Uh, and, and it was a question, it said, why do you need that? And it stopped me in my tracks. Wow! It's a, and I, I remember I have the handle right here, and it stopped me in my tracks. And it's, why do you need that? And by that time, I couldn't lie because I already knew the truth. So the lie was because I like it. No, no, no. You got to go deeper than that. Like, why do you really need it? And I, I tried like a, a lesser lie and a lesser lie and a lesser lie, and the words just wouldn't come out of my mouth until the truth came out, which was. I need it because it validates me in front of other people. And I feel awkward and uncomfortable being in an area where there's maybe high net worth people. Um, and this makes me feel like I'm part of that club or that group. And it was like, wow, you know, it was wow. And it was the, the, the moment that I realized, like I had a decision to make. It was, I was gonna be defined still by this, this thing, you know, call it the Ferrari, or I was gonna be defined by what's inside of me. And, um, and the next day I sold it. And um, so when you, so your story, it's like, it's resonating with me a lot. I, I know what helped me and I know what triggered me, but if, if there's a listener out there that, you know, maybe they're a high profile lawyer or mm -hmm. they're like a you know superstar real estate agent or they're uh you know they're a gunning and going business person high motivation that is out there grinding and working and and yet feels hollow inside what 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 started this journey for you what was that moment that like that made you feel whoa something's not right it was just it was just i i think joy is a gps and um yeah, and I just, if I may, I just want to go back to your story because oh, yeah. I think it was very powerful, Danny, and it makes me think of the timeless principle, and it sure isn't mine, but you want to be in the world, but not of it. Mm. You want to be in the world, but not of it. You want to be in it, playing the game, doing the work, building the relationships, handcrafting a life that's gorgeous on your own terms, and yet, and this is my ideal, you want to be in the world, but you want to be like those great spiritual masters who need nothing. And I think, and that brings me to another word that I think is hopefully valuable, which is detachment. Have the nice things, have the social media followers, have the great reputation, but be, don't be attached to it. So if you say, what was the moment for me? There wasn't a moment. It was a it was, you know, the Lao Tzu, the thousand mile journey begins with a single step. It was just one step led me here, another step led me here. And it was just, you know, and every day I'm getting up and I do MV, I call it MVP in my methodology, meditation, mm -hmm. visualization, and prayer. You know, I've, I've written this book, The 5 a.m. Club. So morning yeah. routine is very important to me. And, and anyone who's watching, I would encourage them to, Get up at 5 a.m. I think there's magic in the air. The uh, the great sages get up often. It was between three and six in the morning because there's a certain 
quietude in the morning. There's a certain stillness. There's a certain vibration that allows your prayers to be heard, that allows when you read the books of wisdom to have a deeper impression. There's great science that says now when we go to sleep, the brain has a mechanism to wash itself. And I believe, I was thinking about this the other day, it's almost like you're climbing Mount Everest as you go through your days, but while you're up at 5 a.m. or 4.30 while the rest of the world is asleep, it gives you that time to build yourself, hmm. gives you that time to strengthen yourself, gives you that time to anchor into your values and what you want to stand for and what you must do so that when you walk in in the noise of the world, you're your own person. You're, you're your own person. Mm -hmm. I love that. This week's episode is brought to you by the community. Picture a world of limitless potential growth, regardless of your age, your gender, your background, or any of the things that you always hear will stop you. Step into our community. It's your pathway to self-improvement. It allows you to enjoy boundless access to all of your favorite topics and the things that you want more information on that you hear in the podcast. And quite frankly, guys, it's like having a personal coach right at your fingertips, all for less than the cost of two Starbucks coffees a month. Why wait? Go to dannymorell.com backslash community to embark on your journey towards the life you've always dreamed of. Join the community today and transform your personal growth into a remarkable reality. Go to dannymorell.com backslash community now. We're at a time right now where it seems as though, gosh, right now, every half, half a year, there is some sort of chaos. Mm. There's, there's something going on in the world that is distracting us, that is pulling us, that is causing us to fight with each other, that is causing us to pick sides, right? And, um, and as a result, I think a lot of people are having a hard time picking themselves, you know? And what you're talking about, your MVP and waking up early it's getting difficult for people, you know, because there's so much depression, there's so much anger, there's so much anxiety and fear. Um, talk to me about the importance of waking up early. Talk to me ab about um, the 5 a.m. The 5 a.m. club. The 5 a.m. club and, and MVP. If, if a human being is out there and they're like, listen, you know, I, I, I've heard this stuff before, but it feels like now I'm ready. Like, where do they begin and why? <laughs> Well, Danny, you're completely right. We live in a world of polycrisis, mm -hmm. and there has never been so much danger in the world as there is now in over 50 years. And it's only going to, it's only going to accelerate. Mm -hmm. And people are saying each year for the next five years will be a quantum leap in terms of the volatility. And then... I'm, I'm sort of smiling because I think about Mahatma Gandhi when you, when, on your point, which is, well, there's a lot going on in the world. I don't have time to meditate. I don't have time to exercise. I don't have time to journal. I don't have time to read. I don't have time to be a member of the 5 a.m. club or whatever it is. And I'm smiling because I think about Mahatma Gandhi, great hero in my life. And he said, um, I usually meditate for an hour every day, but I have a very busy day ahead. So I better meditate for two. <laughs> I love Isn't that. Isn't that good? I love that. So, I love that. So it it's like we have a busy world ahead. <laughs> right. Yeah. You better meditate. We better meditate and take our personal growth even more. Because how do you handle volatility? How do you handle the economic upheaval ahead? How do you handle the polarization you're speaking about? How do you handle the geopolitical mess on the planet right now? Well, you become the hero that you're waiting for. That's right. Heroes emerge not in the sunshine, but heroes emerge from the shadows. Nelson Mandela became Nelson. I, I, my life changed a number of years ago when I stood in Nelson Mandela's prison cell. I've been there twice. The first time changed my life. And I took the ferry. I went to Robin Island where he was kept in prison for 18 years. I saw the limestone quarry where he did backbreaking labor, damaged his lungs, damaged his eyesight from the limestone. I saw the propaganda office where they would hide the letters from Winnie and his family. 
I saw the showers where he would shower as an elderly man while the young jailers would laugh at him. And then I was taken into his room, which was a very small room. And Danny, there wasn't even a bed. There wasn't even a bed in that room. For the first two years, he didn't, wasn't allowed to wear trousers. And it gets very cold. And yet when he emerged, if you look at every picture of Nelson Mandela after he emerged from prison, he's smiling. smiling. He's smiling. He's smiling. It's because he used the 18 years to make himself into a hero. He used the 18 years to understand what forgiveness is all about. I met someone very close to him. She said, he went into prison a very angry man and he emerged Nelson Mandela. Mm. Wow. Yeah, he emerged Nelson Mandela to the point where when he became the president, he forg he invited the prosecutor who wanted it, the death penalty to dinner and he invited the jailer who would keep him out, outside of his, you know, stood outside of his jail to his inauguration as the president. And he was asked, why would you do that? And he said, well, if I didn't, I'd still be in jail. And my point is simply... Yes, the world is messy, but victims are frightened by change. Heroes are inspired by change. This, what's coming, is the best time to look at your, look what's going on in your body and heal your fear. It's the best time. If you're feeling hate for someone else because they belong to another, whatever it is, creed, go into yourself and we can talk about all the methodologies and tools that I teach in the 5 a.m. club and the Everyday Hero Manifesto that have helped millions of people work on yourself so you're an instrument of love. Yeah, It's a great time. When do you build a great business? In a depression. That's right, yeah. Because everyone else is contracted and they're not hiring and they're scared and they're surviving. What's the best time to serve? It's when people are in need. So I, I'm very bullish and optimistic about the future, but I, I work very hard to protect my optimism. I love that. I love that. And so the first one you said was med meditation, right? It's MVP. Um, I, I want to hone in on meditation for, for a little bit um, because you have um, um, y your energy, I sense, is just very... Uh, it's, you're very centered. How, what does your meditation practice look like, feel like, and how could somebody begin? Sure. So how, how someone would begin, I was in Dubai a few months ago and the host said, um, great, we've talked about this, love it, where do I begin? And I was polite, hopefully, but my answer was you begin. And so when everyone says like, where do I begin? sometimes it's 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 a great way to sabotage ourselves to try to intellectualize where do we begin where do you, how do you begin at meditation for someone who wants to start sure do it right now just yeah. begin yeah you know there's so many apps that you can use you just begin and i would say start microdose it don't worry about two hours of meditation if you can do one hour that's great if you can't do one hour do 45 minutes you can't do 45 minutes do 30 minutes can't do 30 minutes do three minutes and build up to it meditation is so powerful what does my practice look like i you know i used to get up at 5 a.m now 4 a.m is such a sweet spot and it's interesting because if it might sound strange to people who don't get up early, but it's actually a wonderful time to get up. And what I'll do is I'll just often lay in bed and I'll visualize. And, and often I'll do a, a visualization, call it a meditation where there's a, a yellow light, you know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm, like a white mm -hmm. light of peace and, mm -hmm. and po genuine power and love and goodness. And then I'll see the white light moving through my body and then I'll see it moving, expanding into my room and then into my neighborhood. So I'm sending out good wishes and goodwill to my neighborhood and community. And then I'll see it filling my city and then the country, then the continent, then the, then the planet and then the universe. That's something I really, I really love to do. I love that. So, uh, sometimes I pray verbally. I think every prayer can be heard. So I'll pray if I, you know, there's, there's things I'm trying to work on. Maybe it's more patience, maybe it's forgiveness, whatever, maybe, whatever it is. I will 
voice it and and pray to my higher power for what I what I want. And then so I'll often do that process for about an hour. And that might sound long, but it's actually really quite quick. Mm-hmm. And then it's about quarter to f- I'll, quarter to five. I'll get ready and I'll he- head to the gym and I'll put in some time in the gym. I'll make sure I hydrate because that's great for mitochondrial function. I will always listen, to, mostly listen to a, a podcast or an audio book. So I've got that 30 minutes of cardio while I'm learning and that releases dopamine and I believe it releases BD and F brain derived neurotrophic factor. Here's another bonus tip, which is the way you feel after a workout is never the way you feel just before the workout. Mm -hmm. And then I will do some weights. I'm big on mobility now because mobility I think is very important. I want to talk to you about it. Yeah, sure. And now it's about six o'clock. I've spent an hour of MVP, meditation, visualization, and prayer. I've spent an hour in the gym listening to something wonderful. I feel so strong, centered, optimistic. I then have two cups of coffee. I go back to my writing room and I'll have two cups of coffee, great cognitive enhancer, and I'll write in a journal and I'll just download gratitude or review my goals or whatever. I'll read something good and I start my day. I love that. I love that. Mobility. I just posted something yesterday where you know i'm the individual that for so long in his life has not been able to touch his toes without bending his knees and i'm finally now able to do it great but that came through a a new level of respect for yoga um i used to think or see yoga as this thing that i couldn't do and as a result of me not being able to do it i just kind of You know, my brain, my mind always wanted to only participate in things that I was good at, right? And uh, and then I, I flipped it and I started to realize that the very thing you can't do, you should be able to do. And if you can't do it, you have to ask yourself why you can't do it. And it became like this this game and this dance of like, you know, handstand pushups and all these things that are like, I just want my body to be able to do, you know, uh, to feel powerful and flexible and mobile and strong in it. And um, and it's also beautiful because you get so much trapped in your body, you know, mm. so much energy trapped in your body. When you talk about mobility, uh, we haven't even spoken about this, but how does yoga play a part in your life? How does stretching, uh, why is that so important for you now? Because I'm old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't, I, I would, you know, 20 years ago, I would recover so quickly i didn't need to stretch and i noticed in the pandemic i was starting to feel stiffer because i wasn't traveling as much and i wasn't at soul cycle you know all that kind of thing and so i just made mobility a priority because i want to i want to feel i want to feel young in my body yeah and uh, i'm going to be i'm going to be 60 next year so i wanted to make sure you know i i i think one of the keys to service and have a great impact. And one of the keys to just enjoying life is making is, is longevity. Uh, and so I want to be around for, for a long time. I love that. And so where does yoga fit in? Well, uh, it fits in because my partner, Al is a yoga teacher. Really? I don't do yoga. Okay. I do yoga moves. Like I do the, the pelvic, the pelvic, uh, tilt, I guess you call it. And I do a little bit of downward dog. And some of my mobility exercises are clearly from yoga, but L is uh, the yoga influence in my life. But mobility, Saturday mornings, I go to a mobility class and it's really quite important to me. And I absolutely love it. A pigeon. I love the pigeon. I was going to say pigeon is pigeon is just wonderful. great. Just if you wonderful. do, if you run or whatever, pigeon is just like whoa. It yeah, feels so it really good. Is. And then in the Five AM Club, I talk about a whole series of protocols for elite performance, and one of them is the two massage protocol. And so what I suggest is twice a week get two massages, and that's been a game changer for the billionaires and sports stars and titans of industry that I mentor. And a lot of people say, well, it'll cost you money, and I I hear that, and I understand it, but illness will cost a lot more. Sure. And so mobility is so key and massage is really helpful. And then of course, rest. People sometimes think, well, you you evangelize the 5 a.m. club, you know, there's a lot of science that says 
sleep is essential. Well, there's a whole chapter in the book called The Essentialness of Sleep. Getting up early has nothing to do with being sleep deprived. It's just get to bed a little bit earlier, earlier. right? So sleep is not a luxury. Sleep is a necessity. Yeah. Yeah. What time do you go to bed? I go to sleep at about between 10 and 11. But my secret weapon, Danny, is a nap. A nap. I love about four o'clock, five o'clock. I'll take a one hour nap and I almost get an extra day because I feel so strong after that nap. I love that. I yeah. Love that. Okay. You just posted this uh, and it struck me and I, and I, and I want to I I talk, talk about this. 40 things I wish I'd known at 40. Wow. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. This yeah, is, it was sure, beautiful. Sure. I Thank love you. seeing this. So number one, the family flowers and walks in the woods would bring me more happiness than cars, watches, and houses ever would. Speak on that. Well, I just think it's true. Like flowers bring great flowers. I, I find are very beautiful. Okay. Um, family is everything. You know, we, like I mentioned, we, I have my son Colby here in the studio today. Family, my parents are in their 80s. My parents are heroes in my life. My daughter, Bianca, my partner, Al, uh, our extended family, even my team who's here today. You know, I mean, this is, the, I feel like my family. Yeah. And I find that's rich. You know, that's, mm. flowers are rich. Family mm. is rich. Um, walks, walks in the woods where you connect to something higher than yourself and you smell the, the moss and you maybe see the, the rays of sun moving through the trees. We've forgotten that that's what real magic is. And I haven't found that material things have been really clear right from the outset of our time together, nothing wrong with them. They can provide great beauty. Mm -hmm. But for me, those things you just mentioned provide a lot more beauty. I love that. I love that. Number two, the, the, that getting super fit would multiply my creativity, productivity, and prosperity considerably. Right. Well, people talk often about fit. You look very fit, right? Like fitness. Oh, it's great because I'll live longer and I'll have better health and more energy and all that kind of thing. Yet, if you really want to significantly improve your income and your impact, I call these the twin currencies, your income and impact. Best thing you can do is get fit like a pro athlete. Mm. Because one, when, when I mentor the billionaires, one of the things they have in common, we can, we can deconstruct what I've experienced mentoring so many of them. But one of the things they have in common is extraordinarily high levels of energy. And so your energy is contagious. When you have high energy, people feel it. But also when you have high energy, you can get big things done. Too many good people have great dreams, but they don't have the energy to execute around their dreams. And so getting fit is just mission critical to living a great life and being a great entrepreneur and getting big things done. I appreciate that. Deconstruct for me. This is on a, this is me asking sure. now. What, what do you see? What do you see as another common denominator or two in, in billionaires that, that you mentor? They are careless about the good opinions of other people. They couldn't care less about what you think of them. To have the results 5%, on, only 5% of the population has, we've got to be willing to do what 95% of the population does not do. And too many good people care a lot about what other people think. That, Robin, you spat that out like like you didn't have to think about that. Yeah, I just, I see it so That must clearly. be so present for you. It's so you're... present. And it's so present for me because I don't want to be someone who is a follower. Yeah. You know, and it's, and and we've been speaking very candidly. I mean, we're human beings. If we're, we're tribally, neurobiologically, we're, we're tribal. We're hardwired neurobiologically to fit into the herd because if we don't if we didn't a thousand years ago we die yeah now here we are in the modern age here in london and still subconsciously we are very tuned in to what other people are thinking about us and their perception 
So as soon as we come up with a visionary idea or a new habit or a new <laughs> app or a new opinion that disrupts the status quo, and someone goes, <laughs> yeah, that's silly, that's stupid. Oh yeah, are you crazy? That, that Be practical. We actually believe their opinion. But the billionaires and any visionary, let's talk about Nikola Tesla, Hedy Lamarr, Albert Einstein, M Michel Basquiat, these people said, look at Basquiat's paintings. They're, they're so strange compared to what the traditional art that was popular at the time. Mm. So uh, the billionaires is like, they're careless about the good opinions of others. They could not care less what you think about their habits because many of them have bizarre habits and they couldn't care less about their what you think about their vision they're going to get the job they're going to get the job done so that would be one of the quick things that i one of the things that i notice about them the second thing is they're charismatic whether it's a quiet charisma or a loud charisma i think about steve jobs his reality distortion field you thought about he'd share an idea or you'd hear it and you'd say what a silly idea and then you're in his presence and you walk away and you go of course we're going to get the iphone done yeah I love that. I laughed because I, I think of my relationship with my friend Casper here, who, who manages all my stuff. It's like I'll have a post or I'll have a, uh, you know, our stuff does pretty well on, on, on socials. People seem to engage with it at, at a high level. But if I'm honest, at the, at the core, at the core, my message is a topic that might rub people the wrong way, which it's getting from here to here, you know? And sometimes if the message is too deep, I'll back away from it, you know? And Casper, you know, has his energy about him and there's like, what's wrong with you like, with it? Like, yeah, but it's, it's gonna rub people the wrong way. So that first one spoke to me, you know, a lot in a big way. Um, do you know, know anything about human design? You know, Yes, because Elle has studied human design and she did my human design and yeah. it was, out of all the tests I've done, it was the most perceptive. Yeah. Um, in my human design, uh, disappointment and disappointing others is like a thing. Wow. So that's, yeah. So it, it, it shows up. So it's something that I'm, you know, I'm working through. So I, I appreciate that. Well, th this is very exciting for me to hear what you just said, because I think the place where your fear lives is the place where your greatness lies. I, I know that. I know. So, yeah. so that place you, your instinct wants to take you to where you say, I want to go and sh go deep, but I'm afraid people, I might lose people on the way. I would predict when you go to where you really want to go, you might lose some people, but you're going to gain the people who are aching and longing to receive that. It's, I'll take it a step further, Rob. I don't know if it's losing the people that bothers me. It's, it's, it's like the letting people down or, um, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a disappointment thing, you know, because the losing people, you, you know, when we lose the most people on socials, just to give you mm -hmm. an, whenever I post anything about my, my fiance and I, we lose, we lose people. Wow, that's because, strange, right? <clears throat> because people have a hard time with it. People have a hard time with, she's younger, she's beautiful, she's, uh, she could care less. Her energy is very centered. She could care less what you think. Uh, in many ways, we're like, we're like a mirror. You know, it's like love doesn't love doesn't care. Love doesn't care how old you are or the color of your skin or your profession, your profession. And in many ways, <clears throat> my relationship with her was a journey of finding love, like real love, you know, and, and I think it presents a mirror for people and, and it gets them upset. But yeah, anyhow, I thought I'd share that. Well, I, I would say you going to that deep place that you want to get to yeah. is you being most truthful to yourself and you shining a light like yeah. it just lights you up and i think when we do what lights us up we not only find success in the world but we light up the world i love that and so you talk about that disappointment you don't want to disappoint anyone i think you just do the opposite you go to that place that's scaring you right now you're going to elate people versus disappoint people 
I think I think we're at our best when we're doing the things that bring us joy. You know, in the Five M Club, I've got a model, and it's called Joy as a GPS. And if you could just visualize it, there's three elements to it. Joy is a GPS. Number one, people, places, and pursuits. People, places, and pursuits. When we go to the, when we are with the people who bring us joy, joy is your GPS, so you feel it. When you're with the people who bring you joy, that's where the universe wants you to be. Mm. And related to that, the people who degrade your joy, strip them out of your life, your life will change because of this podcast, just hearing that idea. That's right. When I'm mentoring someone, we do a list, an inventory. Who are the people that bring you joy? Who are the people that degrade your joy? Strip those out, love them from afar, and watch what happens to your life. The second element of this model after people is places. Go to the places that bring you joy. For some people, it's Zurich. For some people, it's Bogota. Right. But you know when you land there, something comes, that's where you need to be. Yeah. And then the third thing, pursuits. When you do the pursuits that fill you with joy, that's where you're meant to be. And so you doing what brings you joy in terms of taking people to that deep place where you're worried about you know, uncomfortability, yeah. that is, is gonna be so good for the world. I love it. it. It feels like the ultimate purpose. Great. Yeah. I love that. So if you've been listening to my podcast for a while, you'll know that I'm a strong believer and advocate for plant medicine and its ability to awaken and heal the mind, body, and soul. It's a belief that is deeply rooted in my own personal experience with both ayahuasca and psilocybin mushrooms. And many of you for years have always asked me, you know, Danny, where do I go? Who can I trust? And there is only one place I would ever recommend or put my name behind, and that is Reunion. Reunion is a place where you could set yourself free from whatever is holding you back from living the life of your dreams. It's a beachfront, beautiful property that is in Costa Rica. And what I love about it is that it's not for profit. And this is the only thing that they focus on is the preservation and the safe utilization of these beautiful, wonderful medicines. And I only feel comfortable putting my name behind it because I am personal friends and have journeyed with some of the members of the facilitating team. Guys, I'm honored to have aligned myself with them to create the Higher Self Scholarship Fund. It's a fund whose purpose is in helping people who don't have the means to experience these medicines and yet have the desire to. And every time one of you books a retreat with Reunion, $100 from every booking is going to go into this fund and we will be sharing this money with people on a monthly and bi-monthly basis. So help me help others by using the code Danny Reunion when you go to register register to experience your own life transformational journey. To find out more, go to reunionexperience.org and get ready. Number next, <clears throat> that, oh, you, you literally took the words out of my mouth, that your choice of relationship partner is one of the main sources of your success or failure, joy or misery, misery and tranquility or worry. <laughs> well, I mean, what can I say? We know it's true. Yeah. We know it's true. I believe your choice of partner is 90% of your happiness. Yeah. And if you're an entrepreneur, finding the right person, that's another thing, you know, you if you want to be super productive, high impact, massively innovative, and you want to win in business, You've got to have your home foundation absolutely calibrated because otherwise you can't do anything in business. So I think your choice of partner is 90% of your joy. I, I, I will agree and I will say that the minute Jen came into my life, not only your joy, but it's this thing where it's like everything I've ever wanted in life started to just flow, it just started to come because, because that is rock solid, you know? Um, and I think so many people have a difficult time with that because um, they're afraid, you know, mm. they're, they're afraid of what life could be like if they actually were honest about what they really want or love to feel like. Yeah, I mean, I hadn't planned to talk about love and I'm certainly no expert at it, Danny, but 
it's that old idea, which is you've got to be the person you want to attract. That's it. Number one, I would say. So I'm sure you, I believe you attracted Jen. Yeah. And I don't, I also agree. You don't choose love. Love chooses you. I also have learned that some people are in our lives for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. That's right. And I think the worst reason to be in a relationship with someone is because you're too scared to reach for the partner you really deserve. Which ultimately is you. Well, I think, you know, your primary relationship, which is your relationship with yourself is everything. And that gets us back to the 5 a.m. club, sure. morning routine, personal healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing, nature walking, journal writing, mantra using. You're building your finest you. And I wanted to mention, come back to that word remembering. It's not about transformation. So many people talk about personal transformation. I like the term. Mm -hmm. I think there's a better term, which is self-remembering. The whole idea is, and I know we can go here together, yeah. but we were born into perfection and then we That's get right. resigned into mediocrity That's right. through micro and macro trauma. And then the world shuts us down and we become figments of who we truly are. So the goal is not to go off to some mountaintop. The goal is to remember who, who was I before the world hurt me and taught me to forget who I truly am. That's right. So it's self-remembering, not personal transformation. And so as we self-remember through the methodologies, step by step, we build a great relationship with ourselves. And once we, to state the platitude, once we respect ourselves, we love ourselves, we don't need the Ferrari, we enjoy the Ferrari if, it me, if it's right for us, but we don't need it, we're fine naked in a seaside cottage, we're in bliss. That's yeah. the ultimate goal, Yeah. right? Well, then you your relationship with your partner is one of love, trust, your relationship with, and then people say, well, is this relevant to business? Of course it is. 100%. You go to a business meeting and you connect at a deep level with your partners or your investors and they trust you and respect you and they feel your passion for your vision. Is it relationship? For, is it relevant for people on the street? Of course it is. You're kind to strangers, you're generous, you're optimistic. People say, oh, you have this charismatic energy that fills the room with light. That came because of your relationship with you. I love that. I love that. Number next. Kim Kardashian just retreat, retreat, reposted these right here. They come from the Everyday Hero Manifesto. Oh, really? Yeah, people really like these 40 then, lessons I wish I'd known at 40. I love them. Yeah. I love them. Uh, that I do my finest work when I'd be working in the hotel rooms and flying on airplanes rather than when chained to an office desk. The places you work have an outsized impact on the quality of your work. If you look at the great artists, they take their workspaces seriously. Hmm. Andrew Wyeth, the great American artist, had Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania, this barn where he'd go work. James Bond creator Ian Fleming bought a home in Jamaica called Goldeneye. And he was so careful about his workplace, the gardeners who would take care of his flowers, if they would walk across the lawn and affect his view of the ocean, he would say, don't work that day. And all I'm saying is sometimes we don't pay attention to where we work. We work in a coffee shop or nothing wrong with these things. Sure. But if you want to play at world class and you want to produce world, ma the marketplace rewards magic. So our job as creators is to push magic into the world that is deeply in need of magic. Well, if you want to push magic, you've got to know what magic looks like, smells like, tastes like. So go to invest in a beautiful hotel room, for example, even if it's in your own city. Mm -hmm. And that might cost you a lot of money. But think about, and I learned this from Warren Buffett, it's not the amount of money, it's the return on investment. If you go into a beautiful hotel room, it makes you feel like, you know, incredible. And because of that elation and the dopamine and no one's distracting you, you get into flow state. 
And you start, and you write over those two or three days, you, you write a piece of code or you come up with a vision for a multi-billion dollar company or you do three chapters in your book that is the best work that you push out in the world. Well, so you spend, let's say $10,000 that you, let's say you spend $10,000. What's the return on investment? It could be millions of yeah. dollars. So you've got to work in beautiful places. And live in one as well. I think where you live is it's incredibly just, important. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, good friendships are priceless treasures and old friends are the most precious ones. I, I think that's true, isn't yeah, it? I love that. That one's simple. Simple. Not, yeah, yeah. Um, that heaven helps those who help themselves. So do your best and let your higher power do the rest. I don't know what you think, Danny, but... I think we think the same. Yeah, I think so too. I, I, I feel like I've known you for a long <laughs> yeah. time, you know? Yeah. Uh, yes, heaven helps those who help themselves. We live in a world where I believe it's become too easy to become entitled, right? And so I, I saw a gentleman during the pandemic. He said, oh, I, I'm running a, a restaurant and the government should be doing more to help me. Well, I, I don't think that's how business works. I don't think that's how life works. I don't you think know? that's how life if that, works. Unless it's, that's how you choose it to work. <laughs> unless how, but right? then you're going to live a very limited life. Right? Yeah. Like you get into a relationship problem, you know, yeah. like mommy, come and help me. Like, right, right. You know, yeah. and, and, and yeah. an entrepreneur, we've got to help ourselves. And if, if the world falls apart and you haven't done your contingency planning and your financial planning and you haven't done your scenario planning, then you haven't done your job and it's no one else's fault but yours. Mm -hmm. In my methodology, I have a term called APR, absolute personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so heaven helps those who help themselves. If in messy times and in great times, you work hard and you read the books and you study the podcasts and you build yourself and you understand your marketplace, good things will happen to you. And if you just show up and say, world, make me world class, you're, you're not going to you're not going to win. So I really believe that we've, we must do our part. And hard work is really important to me. I rest well, mm -hmm. but hard, there's something beautiful about hard work. It's honoring your labor, honoring your maker, setting a good example. I mean, I think we've gone the, I'm not, I've never been hustle and grind, you know, mm -hmm. I've always been, Rest is a luxury, it is not a luxury, it's a necessity. How do you sustain world class? You rest well, you recover, you have great vacations, all that kind of thing. But hard word has is has, hard work has become a dirty word. Mm. And I, I feel there's great dignity in in working hard. I think we've swan from hustle and grind to too much leisure too much relaxation and i think you know it's it's all yin yang that's right, male yeah. female it's it's got to be a balance i love that and the last one is uh people putting you down is a sign of your increasing success yeah you, you can tell when you're making traction around your ethical ambitions when people throw arrows at you I mean, en uh, envy is real. Yeah. So when you start to leave the crowd, people are envious consciously. And I would actually say, and I'd love to know your thoughts on it, but I think subconsciously as well, when they see someone shining a light, whether it's a great craftsperson, whether it's someone who has a beautiful life, whether it's a, someone who's doing economically well or has a beautiful home, it brings up people's subconscious pain of their own personal potential that they have not expressed. It's it's a it's a reflection because we're all one, Robin. We're not no, no one is different or better than anyone else. Um, when you know when we leave this plane, we return. It's it's we're all going back to the same place. When, when you have an issue with someone who has an incredible life, what you really have an issue with is yourself. 
because all they are doing for you at the deepest level is reflecting back to you the part of you that you haven't uh, chosen to or known how to um, um, grow. And the part of you that you haven't had the ability, the courage, the knowledge to explore, to remember, uh, and to and to share with the world. That's it. Um, and if you could stop, if we could all stop looking at people who do incredible things and pointing the finger at them, and you know wanting. Uh, the government and the God knows who to to help us and to you know make it easier for us or to or to blame the people. So many people right now, like the people that people love picking on the most, is Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. And I'd say, what if on the other side of that, you flip it and you say. Love them, send them love, because they are just showing you who you could be. I, I, I hear you and I agree with you, and I also think jealousy is a GPS. So people who are jealous of what someone else has at a root level, they're jealous because they want what that person has. So yeah. it's a GPS of, oh, okay, this is, and the sec second thing I'd say is you say, people are let's say jealous about or angry with jeff bezos and elon musk and i would say it was the same about mozart and it was the same about aristotle onassis and etc cetera, etc cetera. i think the people who really get jealous don't know what it took to get there hmm. Because I'm reading Walter Isaacson's book on Elon, Elon Musk, Musk right I was, now. I was going to ask you awesome if you were, I, I, I love it and I don't want it to end. Awesome book. But yeah. as you read autobiographies and as you meet these people, and for 25 years I've mentored a lot of the best of the best in business and sports, <laughs> you look at the sacrifices these people make, you look at what time they get up, you look at... I mean, they don't, they don't play video games and they don't spend their best hours, you know, chatting around the water cooler and they don't, you know, accept, sleep in for hours. Can see, these people get the job done. Mm -hmm. And so here's the thing, they love it. They don't see it as a sacrifice. But all I'm saying is when you look at anyone in the sciences, in the arts, in business, in the humanities, if you knew what they had to go through, if you knew the haters they had to deal with, if you knew the lawsuits that they had to overcome, if you knew the things that they suffered through to get to where they are, you wouldn't want to throw rocks at them. You would want to honor them for that. Sure. And that's actually why I think world class is a spiritual pursuit. Hmm. I think people say often think, well, let me be spiritual by doing yoga or meditating. I think building a great business is also a spiritual pursuit because to build a great business, you have to learn forgiveness. To build a great business, you have to learn to grow more leaders. To build a great business, you have to overcome your own demons and insecurities. To build a great business, you have to learn persistence when you feel like giving up. It make, it's, I believe building a great business is a spiritual process that makes you into your finest self. I agree. I agree. And speaking about making you into your finest self, you, you have helped the world with all of your wonderful books. But... I think the world doesn't know, like you've got an exciting announcement. Yes, I, I have. And this is actually the first time I'm announcing it publicly, Danny, but I have a new book coming out. It'll be out April the 9th in bookstores around the world. And we're putting up the pre-order page January the 15th. And um, my publisher has wanted me to keep the title very quiet for uh, about six months, but I'd love to announce it right here. Yeah. And the title of the new book is The Wealth Money Can't Buy. The Wealth Money Can't Buy. <laughs> who, who makes your titles? You have some great well, titles. I, I make them. Really? I make them, yeah. That is wonderful. Yeah. The Wealth Money Can't Buy, and the subtitle is The Eight Hidden Habits to Live Your Richest Life. I love that. 
I want to read it. And, and, and the book is essentially, it's, it's about redefining wealth mm. because society has hypnotized us to think wealth and success is mostly about how much money is in your portfolio and your equity positions. And what I've learned is there are many forms of wealth. Money is only one. And a lot of us feel bad because we don't have all this money, but we have a great family life or we have a portfolio of passions or we love mountain biking in the woods every day that makes us feel like a million dollars. So you don't have the million dollars or $10 million, but you feel like a million dollars, you're rich. If you have enough, you know how many billionaires don't feel like they have enough, yeah. right? And there are a lot of people who have enough. They just, I, I have enough. I love, you're rich. You're rich. That's so the book is a deconstruction with models and stories uh, based on this philosophy. I love that. And, and where do they go for the pre-order? The, the pre-order page is not up yet, but if anyone wants to get the book, one of the early copies, they can go to robinsharma.com, sign up for my newsletter to get on my list. And then when we bring it out, they'll get a notification. Okay. Wonderful. And to follow you on socials? Um, I'm on Instagram. I believe it's uh, Rob, Robin Sharma, S-H-A-R-M-A. -A. Uh, I have a YouTube channel, Robin Sharma, Beautiful. whatever it is on YouTube. And uh, yeah. And to hire you as a coach, because I, I think I might do that. Yeah, myself. I'm doing, wow, I'd love, yeah. I'd love to explore yeah. that possibility. Yeah. I'm doing a lot less mentoring. Yeah. Um, I, it's but, interesting. I, I don't do very much of it. I, I do more group stuff and seminars and stuff but um but i'm in a season in my life where where i'm i'm ready to just like take it to the next level beautiful so, yeah, beautiful yeah. yeah i'd be happy to talk about it yeah. i i've i've slowed down on on the live events and the mentoring and i'm just loving being an author again you know i love that thank you wonderful conversation really a wonderful conversation yeah. i've enjoyed it congratulations and i wish you and jen uh, amazing things thank you so much and uh i hope you guys matt i don't hope i know you guys got a lot out of this week's episode i would say go watch it again and go really listen again and um um and ask yourself what can you take away from it and most importantly what can what can you apply it into your life and uh, we'll see you next week on another episode of the higher self Thanks for watching this week's episode of The Higher Self. If you heard something in this week's episode that caused you to think maybe, just maybe, there was a higher potential for your life. Maybe there was a potential to earn and receive financial freedom, to attract the relationship of your dreams, or to improve your health. That's what we specialize in. We help wonderful human beings like yourself to unravel all of the limiting thoughts, feelings, and emotions that you've been living through so that you can finally tap into your life's truest potential. If you'd like to talk more about that, we invite you to join us on Instagram or Facebook and email us the word discover more. And when my team sees that, they will reach out to you, send you the details of how we could help you on your pathway to a life of abundance, fulfillment, and creating the absolute life of your dreams. Message us right now the words discover more now on Instagram or Facebook, and we'll see you soon.